Hi everyone. This is Jeremiah Dooley from Solid Fire, and we are glad to have you join us for the latest in our series of webinars, this one VMware focused. And today we're going to talk about workload consolidation and look at how we move from uh, enterprise IT silos and start to take uh, more advantage of the software defined data center vision that uh, VMware has painted for us. Uh, with me today, we've got Thomas Bryant, who's a Senior Product Marketing Manager over at VMware. Uh, Thomas, introduce yourself to the crowd and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, hi, I'm Thomas Bryant uh, from VMware. And I, a little about, a bit about me, myself, uh, I work in the management suite business unit, so uh, I kind of look over all of the realized suites of products uh, from a marketing and competitive standpoint. And interesting uh, fact about me, I've been doing VMware now for almost 12 years, uh, and I bet most folks don't remember the movie. But always remember the movie. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. So before we get started into the conversation here, uh, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, feel free, as always, to comment or provide any feedback on the topic, on the content, uh, on the speakers, uh, using whatever social media platform that you are most comfortable with. If you're on Twitter, feel free to go ahead and follow Thomas and I. Uh, make sure to use the Fueled by Solid Fire hashtag, and we will make sure to respond to any questions, comments, uh, bits of snark, anything that you decide to throw up there. Uh, copies of the slides will be available later on the Solid Fire's uh, SlideShare account. And please use the, uh, the questions feature of the webinar over on the left if you have any questions. We'll go through them with any time that we have left at the end. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, from a high-level standpoint, I think what we're going to try to do is talk a little bit about where we are today with uh, IT in general and how we're driving IT transformation and what some of the, the moving, you know, the prime factors behind that are. And then we're going to look a little, a little bit at what happened to virtualization. We did such a great job of it, and we may not have, uh, we may not have leveraged the, the gains that we made. Uh, you know, guys like Thomas and I have been doing this for a while. You know, we, we fought some battles, we won some stuff, and maybe we didn't push that quite as far as, as we wanted to. And then we'll look at the what if. You know, we'll look at uh, what if we could put a platform in place uh, that's a little bit better, a little bit more scalable, a little bit more flexible than what we have today. And we'll dig deep a little bit into one of Thomas's favorite topics, uh, automation and orchestration, and how do we turn manual processes into, um, into not manual processes, and what's required from a platform standpoint and from an organizational standpoint. And then lastly, we'll look at you know, the very tactical, how does this transform what we have in the data center, how does this transform the pieces that we're looking at? So uh, when we start this conversation in general, really we're looking at the fact that IT organizations are facing an entirely new set of challenges that we didn't have five years ago, that we didn't have seven years ago when we started introducing um, GSX in the, at the very beginning of the VMware journey uh, into our data centers. Where we used to have isolated workloads, where we used to have you know, dedicated infrastructure per app, where we used to pre-provision capacity and overbuy based on what we wanted the peak to be, what we've really seen is the software-defined data center is largely around trying to address those challenges where we have lots and lots of workloads, and workloads that spin up and are sized almost infinitely variable and don't necessarily always have a real good idea of what's coming next or how quickly it's going to grow. We have infrastructure that needs to be shared across many business units because we don't have the ability to over-provision. We have to start being more efficient about the infrastructure itself. We have to be able to provide the end users a much more on-demand environment, a much better way to uh, control their own destiny when it comes to spinning up infrastructure that they want to use, and that largely we need to move from a manual administration, right, a guy with a bunch of scripts or uh, somebody sitting in front of a vCenter GUI clicking through things into something that is a little bit more automated. Thomas, when you talk to customers and are looking at kind of where they are, uh, both from an operations standpoint as well as from VMware, I mean, are these the kinds of questions that they're asking you to help them address? Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's kind of, a lot of folks are, are now in that, that middle stage kind of of the, the ramp, and they're just trying to figure out how do I, how, as you said, how do, you, how do I get better efficiency and, and squeeze more out of the infrastructure that I do have? So if we take that one step further, like let's look at the, you know, we've got the whole data center there. If we focus down on just the storage side of things, 
we look at it uh, in, a, in a holistic standpoint, what we've got is a whole range of workloads that fall in different places from a low performance, uh, you know, medium performance and high performance standpoint. And the vast majority of the workloads and the majority of the effort that customers spend on trying to figure out how they can be more efficient is going to be in that middle section. It's a balance of performance and capacity. It's not necessarily where we would traditionally think I need speed over everything else, but it's the most constantly changing. It requires by far the most capital and time. And if we think about it from a flash storage perspective, kind of the first two generations of flash were very focused on the far right-hand side. Right? This is the violin memories. This is the, um, you know, the places where we're trying to accelerate specific applications. We're trying to drive latencies as low as possible. Uh, you know, the, the cost and, and data services on there are fairly rudimentary. And with version 2, when we started looking at all flash arrays, we got a little bit better, right? We started to encroach down in there, but there's still traditionally a fairly limited uh, use case for all flash in the data center. And when we talk to customers today, this is really where they're focusing. What SolidFire is trying to do is expand the amount of workloads or expand the use case for those all flash workloads to be much more holistic across the data center, right? Much the same way, um, you know, VMware really allowed us to start leveraging, um, you know, pooling of capacity for many workloads in the data center, not just uh, the low end. We're trying to come from the opposite direction on the storage side, say that it's not just the high end storage that we're trying to look at. What's interesting about this graph is that the flash market changes really quickly, right? We see lots of new technologies come out. We see lots of new um, you know, uh, uh, companies coming to market, we see capacities changing, performance is changing. What's interesting about this graph over time is that, that we're not worried about uh, new entrants into the market pushing us back to the right of this. As new flash technologies become available, what we actually see is the amount of workloads that safely fit from a financial and operational standpoint inside a flash array actually gets bigger. The disruption in the market will continue to happen at that very high end at the far right. right? So the, the violin memories, the people who are using you know, PCIe flash, when we start looking at some of the new NVMe technologies, when we start looking at some of the in-RAM technologies, uh, the top end of this, there's a lot of disruption in from uh, uh, what type of technology and how can we get faster, better, cheaper. But the vast majority of that market, you know, we've got so much headroom in the SSD space uh, that that only ends up getting bigger. And so the challenge that we see mostly is we get customers who look at this and they nod and they say, okay, this sounds great, but I can't do that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my environment and there's no way that I could, um, you know, take the environment that I have and put enough flash in it to be able to cover all of those workloads. So we drill down and what we find is that it's the architecture of the flash that's sitting there that tends to be uh, the limiting factor. And we know that the architecture matters, um, but what we, what I think as an industry, we don't do a real good job explaining is why. So what's up on the screen? Um, I believe this came from a storage review, uh, dot com review of uh, EMC VNX array, but it's, it's just a pretty picture of a standard two controller storage architecture. There's front end modules, there's um, storage processors, there's some sort of high speed mirror for the cache between the storage processors. There's uh, back end I.O. modules that go out to a series of uh, looped interconnects between disks. And in this case, there's uh, you know, cold data storage on spinning disk and hot data on SSD, but it could just as well uh, be all SSD. And when we're asking customers, you know, why is it that this storage architecture doesn't scale, what it comes down to is fuel. In a storage array, the fuel management is everything. And when we're talking fuel, it's not the performance of the storage array. Right? The SSDs have made that really easy. When we're talking fuel, what we're talking about are the CPU and RAM designed to run the data services. In every modern array, uh, every array that's being marketed today, the data services become the differentiator. It's the secret sauce on the back end. It's how we do compression and deduplication and snapshots and multi-tenancy and QoS and all of the different things that a storage array is actually looked at for, uh, all of that's being driven through metadata. All of that metadata processing and metadata management requires a fairly significant amount of CPU and RAM. 
and you're just never going to be able to get the scalability in the fuel required to run the metadata services out of a two controller architecture. And so what we've seen is that all flash vendors, you know, be it incumbent vendors who are putting all flash in existing arrays, be it new companies who are coming out with dual controller uh, model, uh, all flash arrays that are built from the ground up with the data services, what we see is a lot like what we've seen before. Right? There's a storage array, and on that storage array we run all of our VMware infrastructure, you know, all of our Active Directory controllers, all of our web servers on the back end. And then when we're ready to bring that same operational uh, efficiency and performance to a new workload, we buy another array. We buy one for Vue, we get another array for Mongo, we get another array of a different size for Oracle. And we look at this overall, and where did the efficiency go? Right? The efficiencies got shot because every one of these arrays is over-provisioned. The data center costs go up because I've got multiple arrays, one per workload. My operational costs go through the roof because I have all of these different arrays that I need to maintain, that I need to update, that I need to troubleshoot, that I need to do capacity and performance monitoring on. I don't have the ability to move any of that capacity or performance from application to application. So we have this new tech that everybody's happy with, that's fast, that has metadata services, but we have to deploy it in the same way. Um, is this, Thomas, when you're, talking to, when you're talking to customers, I mean, is this a problem that, that you hear about often? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data silos in, that customers are talking about, and, it, and it's a real pain, not just from the, the overall high-level management, but it, it's the little things that people really go nuts when they have to start talking about doing firmware patches and, and management of the actual array itself. It, it can be a real nightmare for folks. Um, on the automation side, one of the things that we were always challenged with is that it's one thing to be able to do orchestration and automation against one version of something that's spread out across five or six different silos. But since you can't upgrade all five or six silos at the same time, you end up having to run multiple, um, you know, multiple automation paths because you're talking to different versions of code kind of across what is essentially looked at as the same resource. How much additional overhead is that adding to what the customers are doing operationally? It's adding a lot of, of additional overhead. I mean, anytime you're making that, that decision tree, if you will, of your, your automation bigger, there's going to be more times for failure, more times for errors to happen. So anything we can do to reduce that level of complexity in the automation world is, is huge for us. Well, and what's interesting, you look at this slide, and if we took the storage away and we went back in time seven years, what we have here is the exact problem that VMware was brought about to solve. Right? In that case, we had servers that were all bespoke. Right? We had a server that was sized a specific way for different databases. We had a server that ran Exchange. We had a server that ran SQL. We couldn't reuse any of the capacity in that servers. And so you know, when we look back seven years, we fixed this problem on the compute side, right? We took a physical device that had two resources. It had CPU and RAM that were locked in a fixed ratio inside it. And we put a bunch of these into a cluster. We pooled those resources, and then we, we gave kind of two key pieces that made VMware the thing that we know and love today. One was being able to build a resource pool. The second was, um, being able to not just carve out how much of each of those resources I wanted, but giving me the option to guarantee them and say that no matter what's happening on this host, I'm always going to make sure that this VM is somewhere where it has the resources that I know it needs to operate from a business standpoint. And when we look at this and we look at what we won on the virtualization side, you know, the inevitable question is why the hell didn't we push the storage vendors to do the same thing that we pushed the uh, the compute vendors, right? I mean, if you think back to 2007, HP and Dell and IBM, they were not at all happy with VMware, right? That was a, uh, that was a technology that was pushed from the bottom up by the guys, you know, like you and I who were up at 1 o'clock in the morning having to do maintenance on a server because it was the only time we could bring it down. And so we really forced this change and championed this technology. And for whatever reason, we never... We never asked for any of that to get pushed into um, the storage side of things. And so it's, it's kind of, uh, there's this huge dichotomy between how efficient we are um, and how programmatic we are on the compute and memory side. 
and how inefficient and how overbuilt we are on the storage side. And you know, we have this conversation with customers, um, and they kind of shrug and, and say, you know, I, I don't know how we ended up here, uh, but we ended up here. And so I actually I found a really cool video that is the uh, kind of the perfect summation of where we are today. Um, and I'll go ahead and play that here for just a second. Serious? Do you have any idea what? No, no clue. Yeah. Thanks for coming in, guys. All right. Sit down. You got five apes in a cage. You got a banana hanging by a string in the middle of the cage. You got some stairs going to the banana. Now, pretty soon, one of those apes is going to go for the banana. And as soon as he hit the stairs, you take a hose and you spray all five apes with freezing cold water for five minutes. Now, some time passes, and pretty soon another one of the apes is going to make the same attempt with the same result. All five apes get sprayed with the cold water. Now you turn off the cold water, you never use it again. One of the apes is going to go for the banana, he hits the stairs, the other four apes pounce on him and beat the shit out of him, right? Okay. Understandable. Now, you replace one of those original apes with a new ape. After a while, that new ape, he's going to spy that banana, and when he goes for the stairs, the other four apes are going to jump on him and beat the shit out of him, right? Now, time passes, you replace another one of the original apes with a new ape. That new ape is going to go for the banana, the other four apes beat the shit out of him, right? Including the first new ape, who has no idea why he's so enthusiastically beating the shit out of this poor guy, nor why he himself had the shit beat out of him, okay? Now, you keep replacing these original apes with new apes until finally you've got a cage filled with five apes who have never had the freezing cold water sprayed on them, and nevertheless, not one of the apes will ever attempt to climb those stairs again. Why not? Because that's the way it's always been done around here. Thanks for coming in, guys. Those are for you. So I think, I think the phrase, that's the way it's always been done around here, Maybe one of my five least favorite phrases of all time, um, you know, right up there with my kids saying, "I don't know who broke it." Um, it you know, I'm sure you see this all the time, Thomas. But there's no good reason to do it. There's no real justification behind doing it. But that's how it was done when I got here. That's kind of how it gets done now. How, how much do you run into that? Uh, run into it a lot. I mean, people are always tending to be, uh, you know, they're risk averse. They're afraid to make any sort of changes because if what if it breaks? What, what if it doesn't start working? It's my job on the line, and you know, a lot of people take that adage of it, if it ain't broke, you know, there's, you don't need to fix it. And uh, it's a shame because there really, there's a lot of great innovation out there, but people just, they, you get comfortable in the, the status quo. Yeah, and, and some of it's practical, right? Some of it's this is how my budget works or this is how my staffing works. Uh, you know, some of it is selfish. You know, I know how to do this. I'm comfortable doing this. I'm valuable, valuable to my company doing this. Um, when we talk to customers who are kind of stuck in that rut, who are, you know, who say, sure, my storage sucks. It's inefficient. It's inflexible. Uh, there's no agility in it whatsoever. It, you know, operating it is a pain in the ass. But that's what we have and that's kind of what we've done. What we try to do is give them the what-if questions, right? Let's set the stage for, um, you, you know, less of a less of a here's what I do. Let's talk about let's talk about us, but more you know, what if. And in this case, the the, the what if that I want to pose uh, to everybody in the audience is, what if storage wasn't the least flexible resource in the data center, right? What if we could take some of those benefits that we won from virtualization, right? The idea that we have two resources and a single physical thing that we have the ability to scale those resources out and pool them, that we have the ability to deploy those 
um, and be able to guarantee them out to the workloads. Like what if I could treat storage the same way that I treat CPU and compute? And when we ask that, you know, particularly from a legacy infrastructure standpoint, there are an awful lot of roadblocks. The first thing that we need to solve is we need to solve for scale. In a, in a normal two controller array, you have two controllers, and the minute you buy those controllers, you have all the resources, all the fuel that you're ever going to have for that storage array. You know how many disks you're going to be able to attach to it. Um, you know how much throughput you're going to get out of it. And when you get to the effective end of the capacity of you, you know, the first form of capacity, be that capacity or performance, um, when, you, when you run out of that first resource, your alternative is to uh, buy a new array and move the data, or in the best case scenario, forklift upgrade the heads. And you know, even, if that, even if that forklift is being provided to you free of charge, you know, from an operational standpoint, there's still an awful lot of risk. You're still not going to do uh, in a dual controller environment, you're still not going to bring half of your environment offline in the middle of the day while it's under full load. Right? There's still uh, operational challenges there, even if your vendor is, is gracious enough to take the, uh, the, the financial burden off. So when SolidFire started looking at this, um, um, when SolidFire started looking at this problem, what we did was um, decide that we were going to build out the storage array the same way that we would build out a VMware cluster. So we have a base cluster, and every node has two resources in it. It has um, performance, right, so IOPS, and it has capacity, or total amount of space. And as we go through, rather than having to forklift to a new array, if we need any more of either of those resources, we just add a node. And as we add that node, we add the resources of that into the pool the exact same way we would if we were adding another VMware host um, into a VMware cluster because we needed more CPU or RAM. And we just continue adding these. Now, the interesting part is that we're adding the primary resources, which are capacity um, and performance, and we're virtualizing those into pools, and that works exactly the same way that you would expect it to. But there's an added benefit here. An added benefit is that fuel that we were talking about, the CPU resources and the system memory that are required to run all of those metadata heavy services, we're scaling that at the same time. So in effect, whereas in a VMware cluster, we're reserving some amount of the system resources in order for VMware to run the kernel and VMware to run the, um, you know, the user space where it has to manage all of the, the, the VMs that are running and, and all of the reservations that are in there, on the storage side, we get a little bit of an extra bonus because the capacity and performance are embedded resources. The CPU and RAM are system resources. They're just sitting there because every one of these nodes you know, is essentially its own x86 server. So on, on this side, what we've done is we've created those pools. Right? So the first part of the challenge of why, couldn't, um, you know, why wouldn't this work on the storage side, the first hurdle is cleared because the scale-out model just makes more sense when I try to look at storage as the same type of resource consumable um, that I look at uh, VMware being on the, on the CPU and RAM side. So if we do that, we get some benefits. Right? In addition to the stuff on the left there, right, non-disruptive upgrades, the same way we've always done them on the VMware side, evacuate a node, upgrade a node, you know, um, however it is that we want to do rolling upgrades through the cluster, granular, we can add one host at a time instead of having to add an entire array at a time. Uh, we can mix nodes, right? We have the ability to take a cluster and add in nodes that haven't come out yet, right? So if in this case we started with the 2405s with the 240 gig drives, and if what we realize is that we need more capacity than performance, we have the ability to add new generations of solid fire nodes into an existing cluster. Right? This is much the same that VMware did uh, with EVC mode, being able to take different generations of Intel processors um, and being able to vMotion between them by normalizing out the feature sets. In our case, the normalizing out is the element OS software. Right? So being able to mix and match different versions of hardware, uh, being able to mix and match different sizes of nodes all in one cluster becomes no problem. We build the pools on the back end. We handle everything the way that we're supposed to. Um, we have the ability to not only scale out, but we can scale in as well. And so in this case, I have a second cluster, and I have too much capacity in the first and want to move it. So being able to decommission a node out of cluster one and move it over to cluster two becomes just as easy as it would in a VMware environment. Right? Put a host into maintenance, evacuate all the VMs out of it, 
move that host either physically or logically over into another cluster, give those resources into the pools for the second cluster, and then never be able to, you know, never require a forklift up upgrade again. And it's not just individual nodes that can be moved, right? This can be done entire sets of nodes at a time. So if I have two clusters, I need to build a third cluster for a DR site, for a physical, um, you know, for a physically separate data center. Being able to decommission half the nodes in a cluster, provided I have the capacity and, and um, overhead, of course, and being able to move those over, these become completely transient nodes. The cluster is the sum of all of the nodes, not the, um, you know, not tied to any of the individuals. So being able to move things around. Now, now I have some agility around where those pools are and where they sit. Right, so first challenge was I need to be able to pool the resources. We got that one taken care of. The second challenge is I need that to be granular and I need that to be um, as agile as possible in order to be able to take advantage of that node architecture. We've got that one. Now, the last technical problem um, is going to be one of what do I do with this huge pool once I have it? Um, you know, quick pop quiz for you, Thomas. How many times has a storage vendor told you, I want you to take a 10,000 seat VDI environment and a production Oracle database, and I want you to put them on the same storage array? <laughs> All the time. All the time. All the time. Right. So that's one of those ones where um, as a customer, you know, as somebody who used to buy traditional storage arrays, uh, it was worst case scenario. Right? It was worst case scenario having two of those workloads on the same array where if I had a food storm or if I did an Oracle backup, uh, there was no way to control how those apps interacted with each other. Right? I could use rate limiting or I could use SIOC to make sure that neither of those apps would crush the array. Like I could protect the array, but I couldn't protect the individual apps. So in this case, now that I've got this huge addressable pool, right, petabytes of storage, millions of IOPS, if I don't give the customer some way to be able to um, protect those workloads or define the scope of those workloads, much the same way once I define a VM on the VMware side, I can put reservations and limits on the amount of CPU and RAM that they're doing, um, I'm not going to be able to take the best advantage of those. So the third part that we need here to solve the technical problem is guaranteed performance. Uh, per volume QoS settings, what this allows us to do is every time we deploy an app, we have to give it three characteristics. We have to tell it what's the absolute minimum amount of IOPS, no matter what's going on on the rest of the array that this app is always going to have, no matter what. And that's an incredibly hard thing to do architecturally. Right? This can't be bolted onto um, an existing array. You know, this, can't, this isn't a prioritization scheme. This isn't a gold, silver, bronze. This is a specific volume by volume setting that says no matter what happens on this array, you will always have this much. Um, you will always have this much uh, of performance available to you. The se second thing we're going to set is the max. No matter what happens, this this app is never going to consume more than this amount of the capacity of the array. And then we'll give them a burst. If you behave over time, we'll allow you to earn the right to burst above where your max is to a set limit for a specific amount of time before you come back down. And so some storage arrays will do this in general, or will do this around a prioritization scheme. From a solid fire perspective, what we found, the only real way to be able to take advantage of that huge pool of resources is to be able to do this for every, um, every application that's provisioned. So if I have a, um, you know, a, a SQL server that probably only needs 500 IOPS, but I also throw in there an Oracle database that is going to need 1,500 um, IOPS and will let it burst up to 2,000. And then I'm going to put some file servers or some, you know, some low-level servers that are really only going to need about 200 IOPS max. The ability to service this mixed workload environment, um, the ability to treat the two resources of the storage nodes the exact same way that we would treat the CPU and RAM um, in the, the servers in a VMware cluster, the ability to provision those out and then protect them, not protect the array, but protect each workload from each other, this is where we really start to drive home. Um, and we did a great uh, demo video that all of you watching can also find uh, on the YouTube, on the SolidFire YouTube channel around uh, provisioning uh, Mongo database, provisioning Oracle databases, provisioning a SQL database, and then uh, I think 200 VDI desktops all on the same storage array. 
and doing unnatural acts to it, right? Doing a complete reboot of all of the uh, VDI VMs while running a million transactions per minute through an Oracle database, or um, increasing the uh, data processing uh, threads on a Mongo database by you know 60 or 70 percent, and not having the response time on the Oracle database or the VDI desktops uh, get touched at all. So much the same way we don't worry about having mixed workloads running on a VMware cluster. Um, now we have the same benefit of not needing to worry about how uh, mixed workloads are running um, you know, on, on the storage side of things. Same operational methods, um, you know, same way of managing capacity, same way of scaling out the nodes, but now we have the ability to do that across all of the resources in the data center, not just the CPU and RAM that the VMs need. So if we've solved the problem, right, if, if we at this point consider the tech to be fixed, I can pool. Um, I have the fuel to be able to run all of the data services. I have the flexibility to move the nodes around, and I have the ability to protect the workloads from one another. Then the question becomes, you know, and I, and I know that this is your favorite topic, Thomas, um, is what about the operations? You know, why are we still doing things manually? And when Picard gives you that look, you know, you probably need to come up with a, uh, a good answer for him. And because that's the way it's always been done around here, doesn't hold a whole lot of water with him either. So our stance is that everything revolves around the API. And, and that sound you hear is uh, Thomas probably clapping quietly in the background. Um, because everything that we do from a solid fire standpoint is uh, API first and API driven. Whether it's our own uh, user interface and our own cloud monitoring platform, uh, whether it's the plugins, uh, the vCenter, OpenStack, CloudStack, um, you know, vRealize, whether it's the tools, the software development kits and the PowerShell, um, or custom integrations, right? Which I'm, I'm sure, uh, Thomas, you've probably seen more of than, than, you care to, than you care to think about. But the self-service portals and the homegrown apps, uh, the thing that all of those have in common is going to be the SolidFire API that sits under that. Um, from your perspective, Thomas, how much does that, um, kind of how much does that common management point for all of the workloads being run how much does that help in the, you know, for the customers that you're looking at who are trying to drive more automation and orchestration into those workflows? It's huge. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to automate all of this, and the, le like, the less complexity we can have and the more things that we can do through APIs, it, it just reduces the overall surface that we have to manage. And, and automation is, is great, but if you've got to go out and talk to 20 different types of APIs and different things and different boxes, it's just a real headache to try to automate that. And you can do it, but it's just a lot more complicated. So having a single cohesive API that we can go out and talk to for everything is really beneficial for the customers. And the benefits of that, I mean, is that just an operationally easy or um, does that help customers when they're looking to deploy things faster? Like where, where is the, um, I mean, we know that it's a win. You know, so solid fire, I mean, certainly uh, regardless of whether it's a VMware or an OpenStack environment, the fact that everything's available through the API has certainly been a win. Um, but outside of just the, you know, it makes things easier overall, like are there any specific places where that comes in, um, you know, handy, especially for customers who are looking for quick turnarounds or quick wins on the investment that they've made with you guys on the automation side? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of customers that are, are leveraging the Realize Automation Suite are, are using these types of, of automation components to make provisioning of VMware workloads just that much faster. So instead of having to go and, and do provisioning and then potentially talk to a storage team or go to the storage UI and having to provision things, building that into the workflow to go out, create the volumes based on you know, business unit requirements and application requirements, actually build in that type of QoS information right into the provisioning workflow. You know, it reduces human error and it just makes the provisioning time much faster. So IT becomes that, that value add to the business being more agile. And is that, is that a one-time thing? Um, you know, what, one of the things that we see customers using is that the, the process, I mean, the reason that we automate, the reason that we orchestrate is to provide the business value, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there are things that we need to do around operational efficiency and cost. Um, what's the path that customers are taking? Are they kind of jumping in with both feet and saying, automate all of the things, or 
um, you know, catalog all of the things, or is there a progression that you help walk them through from where you know their 90% of their day is spent inside the vCenter GUI to something in the future that's going to drive more value for them? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a wide gambit of customers. There's a lot that that are are fully drinking the Kool Aid, if you will, and jump in and say, I want to automate all the things. But but realistically, um, what I've seen a lot of is people take a very tepid approach. You know, automation is new, and with that can be scary uh, to some extent. So they they slowly step into this, and you know, a lot of times they're starting off with very simple automation of simple tasks, and they're doing it even within IT just to make IT itself more efficient internally for things like provisioning of workloads. And then as they get comfortable with the technologies, they get comfortable with the, those integrations, they start to expand that out to the customer base. And the customers, in their case, are maybe, they may be internal customers or external customers. Awesome. So uh, from the SolidFire standpoint, we see the same thing, right? That whole idea of land and expand works not just for workload consolidation or for how it is that you kind of establish and expand a storage footprint, but also on the orchestration side. Or, or maybe less orchestration and more just um, what, what level of automation is that you're doing. So when we, when we talk to customers, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to them about uh, you know, what is the bleeding limb? What is the, what is the project? What is the application? What is the thing that is causing you the most pain right now from an availability standpoint, right? The storage just can't handle it from a performance standpoint. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, right, you've got a huge maintenance bill that you need to overcome. What is that thing that needs the aspirin right now in order to make it feel better? And we'll use that kind of as the initial start, right? So we'll put the solid fire nodes in place. We'll take one of those IT projects. We'll put it out there and we'll say, okay, you've got to win. Your pro your, the, the application that you're worried about is better. Those users are happy. Now let's take a look at what it is that we can do from a, a strategic standpoint. And one of, the, one of the cool things about the ROI on the SolidFire platform that I think our customers are most appreciative of is that right here, I have a database, I have a project, you know, in this case MongoDB, but it could be VDI, it could be whatever, and I have a, um, an investment that I made in the nodes, and then I have the outcome, right? Better performance, easier operations, whatever it is. So there's a base ROI for what it is that I've bought, um, you know, regardless, even if we're just in a single application environment. The fun part is, and this is where I think traditional two controller arrays really struggle, is that when I add the second workload, right, when I add the VDI initiative in this case, all of a sudden my ROI gets a multiplier because I didn't have to buy a second array. I don't have to operate a second array. I don't have to automate a second array. I don't have to pay maintenance on a second array. I don't have to overbuild the second array. I just add exactly the amount of resources that I need into my pool in order to be able to take care of that second VDI initiative. And even if all I'm doing is vCenter automation, right? even if all I'm doing is using a vCenter plugin and trying to drive the storage tasks into the VMware domain, the VMware administrator domain, this is pretty straightforward. And then every time I add another workload, we add a dev test environment. Notice we didn't add any nodes for this, so the dev test initiative has essentially become free at this point. Right? It's not going to be super high I.O. requirements. It's probably going to use snapshots out of the production environment. You know, the dev test environment comes in there. Maybe we introduce some PowerShell to be able to spin up clones or to be able to spin up um, snapshots of the individual volumes that are holding the databases that we need them to. But we keep adding nodes. We keep adding capacity, performance, CPU, and memory. But as we, keep adding, um, as we keep adding the applications over here on the left, we're going to see that the ROI on this just continues to go up. And if at some point SPBM comes into play, if at some point uh, the vRealize suite that you, know, that, that you work with all the time comes into play, um, all of these become things that are driven by the customer. Right? The consolidation happens as the workloads demand it or as the infrastructure that's supporting it uh, come off uh, you know, come off of maintenance or start having issues or aren't able to support the workload anymore. The automation expands as the value to the business can be realized, right? As the product set matures, as the operational team matures, the nodes scale exactly the way you need them to scale, one at a time, many at a time, large nodes, small nodes, whatever's, whatever's there, and then the resources all get pooled and all get delivered. Um, you know, Thomas, it was funny while we were making the slide 
This looks almost exactly like the slide that I used you know, six, seven years ago in order to justify putting VMware in um, to the data center from a compute standpoint. And it's kind of funny to see, you know, uh, you know, seven years later now we're finally getting back to, oh, let's try to use the same things to, uh, you know, to, to, to make the storage resources a little bit more manageable. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're, you're going after similar use cases and, and concepts, but taking what works really well in the data center and extending it into storage now is, is pretty awesome. How, how much, um, you know, when we talk about the uh, SPBM, the policy-based management, and we look at the integration up into the vRealize suite and into the catalogs, um, I know that you guys have done uh, some great work with some of the releases that have come out. Um, you know, the, the vRealize suite itself has come, you know, I, I can say seriously has come an awful long way in the last you know, 18 to 24 months just in uh, how quickly customers can get it in and start using it. Um, what are the, from, from a VMware standpoint, what are the big gains that you're seeing customers take away from, uh, you know, not just the, the streamlining of how all of the pieces of the suite work together, but the time and energy that VMware's put into kind of updating those products based on the feedback from the customers? I mean, it's a night and day difference. I mean, the, the ability for, for us to be so much more agile uh, and, and to use that as kind of a platform, as a, a single control plane, into storage is just a huge benefit for us, and it's a huge benefit for our customers at the end of the day. Um, of all the pieces of the vRealize suite, you know, which are the ones that, um, you know, I, I know it's a process, and obviously the things that are, that are at the far end of the orchestration spectrum are probably going to have, um, you know, the, the smaller of the, of the user bases, but of all the pieces of that vRealize suite, what are the ones that customers are kind of getting the most immediate value out of today that you would recommend you know, to the to the viewers of this uh, to take take a look at with their VMware teams and find out if it makes sense for them. Yeah, I mean the the one that comes to mind first, of course, is you realize operations uh, and being able to uh, take those actionable alerts and types of information and then actually do things right. So be, it's not it's one thing for alerting engines and a lot of them out there to say, hey, something's wrong. Now go do something. Having that API is huge. And, and for a lot of customers, it's, it's the automation piece as well. I mean, being able to, to tie this all together with the storage policy-based management is, is a huge win because it bridges that gap across the silos from the kind of VMware team and the storage team, and they've kind of traditionally worked in those separate silos. This is kind of a, a, a help in terms of an armistice between those teams to say, hey, let's work together to create a better cohesive story and make this fast. Let's get a lot of value out of it very quickly. Um, it, it is, a lot of people think that, no, it's not there when it comes to provisioning of workloads, but we actually get a lot of traction. A lot of customers come back saying, hey, this is something that we've got a lot of immediate value out of very quickly. That's awesome. I know that from, you know, from our side, we've done a tremendous amount of work with the, uh, with the VMware teams. Um, there was a great Project Magic demo uh, that we, you know, is all over YouTube that we've done uh, in person uh, with, you know, with Ronson Rivera, with a bunch of different members of the team that, uh, that really highlight how the SPDM can be leveraged to do some really cool things you know, not just not just with VVols, right? But even before VVols, before customers are are looking to jump that far, um, you know, our ability to take advantage of some of the stuff that VMware is doing on that policy side, the ability to integrate QoS directly into that, so that we can do things like change the tier of storage that a workload is running on without having to actually move the workload, right? Just by changing the QoS that's on the um, on the volume that belongs to it. You know, we're uh, we are huge fans of the you know the entire view realize suite, whether it's you know in, uh, uh, you know it log insight or uh, operations or orchestration. You know all all of the different pieces of it. I know that uh, internally, you know the value proposition for us is that it's the easiest way for VMware administrators to take advantage of that API. Um, you know, and the feedback that we've gotten from VMware is that having having a single API that is well documented certainly makes you guys' life a little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we've, we've, we've looked at this from a workload perspective. Uh, there are some of you out there who may be the infrastructure guys. 
right? You're looking at a storage array, and you may be asking, you know, what does this do to my data center? So we put together a couple slides here uh, to end off the presentation uh, that we originally built out to talk to uh, the analyst community around what does uh, not just you know not even just solid fire, but what does flash mean for the legacy data center. Um, even outside of the storage, right? I mean, obviously we're a storage product, and when we move workloads, we're traditionally moving them off of a legacy storage platform. But there are other things in the data center that have been part of that infrastructure, part of that platform forever. And in this case, we've got kind of a typical uh, six racks. You know, two of those racks are pretty much taken up by uh, you know flash arrays or legacy SAN arrays or uh, hardware that was specifically sold to you uh, by a database vendor that may be you know, tuned for that database, but you can't run anything else on it. And then on the other side, we've got you know, traditional VMware clustered compute. We've got a bunch of one gig switches that everything connects up to. And then all of the connection between the storage and the compute is done over fiber channel. And so when customers ask, you know, how is SolidFire, how is a you know, scale-out flash-based product going to change my day-to-day -day, uh, data center landscape, you know, we start with fix your problems. Right, the, uh, Horizon View is one of those things that is usually a pretty easy uh, beginning part. Uh, it's it's a it's a noisy I/O application. It usually doesn't work well with other applications, so you're going to have to buy storage for it anyway. And in this case, what we've done is we've taken you know the VMware infrastructure, we've taken Horizon View, we've moved it onto the smallest of the possible uh, SolidFire platforms. We've put a pair of spanky new 10 gig switches up in the top of the cabinet. And we've, you know, we've fixed the, 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 the broken arm. You know, we fixed the thing that hurts the most. Now we have the ability to sit back and based on when things come off of maintenance or based on how quickly we want to transform things, um, we can start to migrate other workloads. And if the next thing that we migrate is the Microsoft and SQL environments, now all of a sudden I can start to refresh my low density compute with something that's a little bit more granular, uh, a little bit easier to scale out better you know, power utilization, space utilization in the data center, and I can start to transpose uh, or replace some of those 1 gig switches uh, with more efficient top of rack 10 gig switches. Um, you'll notice here, I haven't started replacing storage. Right? In this case, most of the stuff that we're moving is going to be based on the needs of the application, not necessarily the desire to decommission storage. But as we get into the next phase, now it starts to be, do I need to renew the maintenance on this legacy array? Do I need to continue to pay Oracle um, for the hardware that they've put in that I can do nothing else but run Oracle on when I can get you know, the same or better response times out of a general purpose and a uh, general purpose storage array and have more control over the IOPS that are in there? So when we move into the next phase, um, you know, we've pretty much removed the one gig and fiber channel altogether, right? We've got this nice, fast, uh, compact, easily managed 10 gig fabric that we're pushing out to all of the nodes, be they storage or um, um, compute. And so being able to do both data and storage over that same Ethernet backbone becomes the path of least resistance, becomes the most efficient way to be able to push that stuff out. For customers who still have uh, fiber channel requirements, like if those nice you know, sparkly Cisco NDS switches uh, just got purchased or were just renewed on maintenance, we can certainly work with Fiber Channel as well. But over time, most of those customers are going to try to pare down to, down to the most efficient operational platform, uh, which in most cases is going to be Ethernet on the back end. You know, and then finally, once we've moved off the last of those databases, um, we get to this point where we've really cut our footprint. We've, we've really cut the, uh, the data center power requirements, we've cut the heat exchange requirements, um, we've made it so that we have a single uh, operational object, that being the solid fire cluster that needs to be managed on the storage side, that lines up both from a consumption model, space power, um, everything with the, um, you know, with the compute and RAM side. Like these are two opposite sides of the same coin, but exactly the same uh, philosophical process by which we deploy the nodes pull the resources, be able to carve them up. And now, once we've solved one data center, we start to get into the fun stuff. Um, you know, sooner or later, there comes a second data center. And whether that's DR, whether that's I'm migrating from one data center to the other, uh, this is where we see customers really leveraging our integration with uh, SRM. 
being able to use the SRA to handle the replication of the back end. Uh, from a solid fire perspective, uh, we went, at least in my opinion, a little bit overboard on the replication types. So today there are actually five different replication um, methods, uh, rep replication personalities that can be used, everything from one-time snapshots to scheduled snapshots to um, consistent group volume snapshots to synchronous and asynchronous. There's, there's so many options there that can be done not just in the two site configuration but between up to five sites and in any direction. Um, you know, we're trying to make the replication between solid fire clusters as easy and full featured as possible. Uh, being able to extend the dedupe domain, being able to extend compression from one storage array to the other, you know, uh, you know, most importantly, those are all core feature sets of the storage array. There's no additional licensing for any of the replication models. Um, you know, trying to bring the idea that moving into a two-site or even a three-site environment, you shouldn't have to end up paying more for appliances to do replication. You shouldn't have to pay more for the feature sets that are involved in there. Um, you paid for that in one site. You just get to take advantage of it in as many sites as you want to. And one of the things that we see, particularly through our service provider program, the Fueled by Solid Fire program, is that there's more and more interest in hosted uh, Solid Fire customers looking at how can I take advantage of that hybrid cloud message that VMware is sending. Um, Thomas, uh, and, and I, I, I don't know the answer to this question, and so I, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but how much work do you guys do from, a, um, you know, from an orchestration and automation standpoint with customers who are looking to leverage you know, um, you know, both things in their data center as well as things like the vCloud Air Network? Is that, so, is that something that's becoming more popular over time? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly still, be, it's still to some extent an edge case for a lot of people because people are still becoming comfortable with, with the overall concept of automation, but those that have already adopted, you know, internal private clouds or using public clouds, it's a natural extension for them, and they're absolutely very interested in how can we leverage both. Yeah, and and from SolidFire, we've always had the ability to do backups to public cloud. So you can take any volume and you can back it up to any external uh, Swift or S3 API capable object store. So we've always had customers using uh, OpenStack clouds. We've always had customers using AWS to be able to back up individual volumes just so you're not wasting production capacity on archive data and so that snapshots actually become a real backup, right, because it's not tied to the original array. And if the array blows up and you needed to restore the volume, you certainly could. Um, the, the more interesting part, I think, for us is not just the backup of the volume but the interaction of the individual VMs. And so when we look at something like vCloud Air, with an automated snapshot-based backup that's integrated into the array with vVols, where every VMDK for every VM is its own object that you can selectively apply a policy to be able to do replication or backup or, or any of those uh, you know, external features that the array supports. I think the, uh, the adoption of that, even just in a backup case, you know, not so much in a hybrid active-active, but even just a where are we going to put backups of individual volumes, um, you know, individual data sets, or individual VMs, I think becomes a lot more interesting. Is that, is that something that um, you guys are predicting going forward with vVols, or is that still pretty much an edge case? No, we're definitely excited to see customers adopt that, that type of uh, kind of tiered model even of where they're going to store things in terms of keeping some things locally on site for, for some of their tier one. Uh, you know, some of the maybe tier two, tier three, you know, leveraging just up to, you know, out to, to vCloud Air or other public clouds uh, or some mixture in between. I mean, everybody's kind of looking at different things, but, but all of the customers that we're working with are very excited by having that flexibility and ha more importantly, just having the choice uh, that they haven't had before. Gotcha. All right, so overall, I guess the question is, are we there yet? And I stole this slide directly from VMware. Uh, they did a great slide, I guess, 18 months, two years ago when they first introduced the concept of the SDDC. And what they, what they said was the SDDC required some stuff, right? Expand virtual compute to all applications, uh, transform storage by specifically aligning it with app demands, virtualizing the network for speed and efficiency and the management tools that give way to automation. Um, if we look at it, 
you know, we, we've, we've talked about the problems we've solved. We talk about where the automation comes in. When we look at it, I feel like we've probably come as close as we have ever been to what VMware intended that software-defined data center to be. Right? There's still work to do. Um, you know, NSX has done some amazing stuff with how do we virtualize the network and how do we turn the network resources into the same consumable programmatic objects that we did to compute that SolidFire is doing on the storage side. So I mean, there's still uh, there's still pieces of this inside the data center that are work in progress. But I feel like from a storage standpoint, um, we at SolidFire have kind of stood up and taken on our part of that challenge, um, and and you know, can at least answer the question to this point from a storage standpoint, we're the we're the best option there is today for taking advantage of that that uh, you know that SDDC vision. And that's not just a solid fire thing, right? That's not just a solid fire platform and what it does. And it's not just the integration, right? Although being able to invest from a company standpoint into those pieces is important. And it's not just the automation that sits on top of that, right? I mean the tools that we use, the plugins, the PowerShell, those sorts of things. What it really become really comes down to is that we've taken that virtualization platform and we've turned it into a, a concrete business value. Whether that's the infrastructure delivery, um, you know, how quickly can we provide infrastructure? How programmatically can we provide infrastructure? Is it on demand? Is it self-service? Is it elastic? Is it all the things that we wanted um, out of a private cloud? Being able to handle both traditional workloads and uh, new workloads, the end user computing, be that desktop virtualization or application virtualization, and then full application deployment, right? The test devs, the uh, DevOps model of being able to deploy directly to the infrastructure um, and treating the infrastructure essentially as a code manifest. Those are the things that when we add all those together, the platform, the integrations, and the automation, um, you know, those are the business values that we're, uh, that we're really trying to drive. So I really I appreciate everybody taking the time uh, to listen to the video. Thomas, you know, thank you so much. It's always awesome to get uh, both your perspective personally, but also from a VMware perspective, you know, on uh, on how we're doing and and where the technology is going on the operations side. So, uh, from all of us at SolidFire here, we really appreciate you taking the time to be on, and hope you'll be back for another one. Absolutely. Thank you again as well. Excellent. So, thank you everybody for uh, joining us for this webinar. Um, this and all future webinars will always be posted up to YouTube. And if you have any questions, uh, please visit us at SolidFire.com and ask us any questions. Thanks, and have a great day.